Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. This week we're wrapping up a short four-part series where we're doing a deep dive into all four of the dichotomies. Now, if you're a new listener or if you're unfamiliar with what the dichotomies are, that's that four-letter code in the Myers-Briggs system for your personality. So, for example, I'm an ENFP in the Myers-Briggs system. It tells me I'm an extrovert, I'm an intuitive, I'm a feeler, and I'm a perceiver. We've already talked about the first letter, introvert, extrovert, split on the dichotomies. The second letter, intuitive, or sensor, the third letter, thinker or feeler. And now we're to the last part of this, J versus P. J stands for judger, P stands for perceiver. Now, first comment again, if you're brand new, the word judger sounds so, well, judgmental, quite frankly, about a person. This person's a judgmental person. They're a judging person. That's not exactly what that means. It's an old style, an old reference. It just means to evaluate or make a judgment about something. And it's the way our minds work, right? We evaluate criteria and information, and then we make judgments about that information. So don't worry, because you're a judger, it doesn't mean that you are judgmental or more judgmental than other people. This is just how your mind works. Yeah. (laughs) Well, and there are reasons why these, these phrases or terms were chosen. And one of the challenges, I think, in really understanding the distinction between judger and perceiver is that this last component was actually in some ways added to the original theory. Yeah. So uh, the original theory, of course, is based on Carl Jung's book, Psychological Types, particularly chapter 10, when he describes what are called cognitive functions, eight cognitive functions. And when the Myers-Briggs system was being developed based on that information, this last letter of judger and perceiver was added in order to give people a roadmap for determining what their cognitive functions or their preferred functions were. So in some ways, it's almost not even a true characteristic dichotomy on its own. Mm. It's more of an indicator of a broader conversation. And I think that's one of the reasons why it can be tough to understand it for ourselves, because to some extent, we have to kind of jerry rig the or, you know, sort of uh, name these characteristics that not every, say, judger is going to identify with or characteristics not every perceiver will you know, resonate with, it's kind of a similar situation to introvert and extrovert. And so um, because of that, it makes it a little tough. And yet we will try. I like to look at it almost like a legend on a map. It helps you place things and understand things in more fidelity. And it is ripe for oversimplification. You know, all judges are organized. All perceivers are chaotic and messy. Done. Right. That's, not a, that's not accurate. Like that just is simply not accurate. But it's really hard to talk about this dichotomy, this split, without diving into the functions. We're going to do our best today, but really the cognitive functions are, they help explain this the most. They help understand this dichotomy the most. And so we're going to limit ourselves by not diving into the functions and still talk about this dichotomy on its own. Yeah. We've hinted at functions a little bit in this series. In the intuitive sensor, we talked about the two different styles of those. When we talked about thinking and feeling, we talked about the different styles of those. Those are what the functions are, but we're just hinting at it. We're not really, that's not our purpose here. Okay, so our purpose is actually to create a distinction between these two sets of characteristics. And I'm gonna say something that's going to sound confusing, but as we fillet it out, I promise it will get less confusing through the course of the conversation. All right, so the easiest way, in my opinion, to understand the distinction between judger and perceiver is to understand that all humans desire two things simultaneously. We all desire organization and and a sense of order, and we simultaneously desire a sense of freedom and spontaneity. We all want both things. But it's really hard to make both things happen simultaneously, particularly in the same space. If you are a person who wants to have a sense of order, say, in your home, it's much more difficult to have a chaotic, spontaneous, improvisational environment. If you're a person who has a preference for order in your vacations, it's much more difficult to also simultaneously be spontaneous and improvisational in your vacation. So it's like, okay, so which one do I choose? 
And the way this works is that uh, judges and perceivers choose their organization and their freedom in different worlds, right? So they get to taste both. They get to have an expression of both of them. And because they choose to do it into two different worlds, it, they don't have to be, these two desires don't have to be in competition with each other. So those two worlds are the inner world and the outer world, all right? Almost like extroversion and introversion. Introversion is a way that we get in touch with who we are internally. Extroversion is how we interface with the outside world. And judges have decided that they prefer their order and organization to be in the outer world. All right, that's where they're going to have that need, that basic human need for order and organization. They're going to express it primarily in the outer world. And that desire for freedom and spontaneity and just a go with the flow feeling, they're going to do that inside themselves, internally. So their freedom happens internally, inside, when they are exploring their inner terrain. For perceivers, they have reversed that preference. They want to have their sense of improvisation, spontaneity, freedom. They want that to be expressed in the outer world. So as they're traveling through life, they would prefer not to have to be tied down to things like timelines as much or planning or trying to figure everything out first and then hitting deploy. They kind of have this sense of wanting to explore the world and go with the flow, sort of be in this effortless flow with their environment and allow it to emerge in front of them. But they still have a desire for order and organization, just like everybody does. And so in order for it to not compete with the outside world, they bring that order and organization inside of themselves. So when they go internal, that's the space that they want everything to be in its place. All right, That's where they want their order and organization. Now, we're going to flay this out a little bit so that it's not that confusing, but, and, and what I just said might make your head spin, especially if you're one or the other and you go, I don't understand what that looks like to the other side. We're going to talk about what that looks like to the other side. But just see this almost as like a quadrant. For people who have judging preferences, they want their inner world to be the place of freedom and their outer world to be a place of order. And for people who have perceive, who are perceivers and have those preferences, they want their freedom to be in the outside world and they want their order to be in their inner world. So where this concept really trips people up is not in the outer world expressions of them, but in the inner world expressions. Because we all know what it looks like to want order in the outside world, right? In our environment and the world around us, right? That's obvious. That's a person who's more tied to concepts like a place for everything and everything in its place. And, you know, to be forewarned and prepared is the best way to go about things and to have, you know, like a looking at the clock and make sure you've got all your resources and ducks in a row and make sure everything's organized where people can find them. That's easy to understand. Outer world spontaneity and improvisation and freedom, that's also obvious, right? That's the person who goes with the flow and just kind of does what makes sense to them. And this is where most of the conversation stops. This is where the judger perceiver conversation ends up going, oh, judges are organized in the outer world, perceivers are chaotic and want freedom, done. And that's pretty much the end of it. But there's this whole other world of the internal space. Yes. And that's why this can be a confusing concept because everybody instinctively knows that they have a desire for the other as well. And that expression happening inside of themselves is private. It's something that generally only we understand about ourselves. And if we're not syncing up with other people and how they do it, we have a tendency to overvalue other people's internal world experience. Like this is my experience with myself. That must be how it's done to go inside. Other people must also be going inside in that way. And then we just don't talk about it. We don't have a conversation about it to sync up You're like, no, actually, I do it totally different. Oh, you do? Really? In your inner world expression? So like you said, Joel, the bullet list ends with the outer world expressions of judger and perceiver. It never taps into really that inner world expression until you get into the concept of cognitive functions, which is why they're so enlightening and insightful. So if you are a person who's just learning about type and this four-part series on dichotomies is like maybe your first dipping a toe in the water, we recommend don't stop here, go to functions. And a lot of this will be a lot more obvious. That said, 
we're not going to talk about cognitive functions. <laughs> we're just going to talk about the, the dichotomies. And so uh, our, our, little, uh, our little pitch, right, our little encouragement to keep going down the rabbit's hole, you can do that on your own time. Okay. So what does it mean to have inner world freedom? And what does it mean to have inner world organization? Because that's, that's the part that's the most complicated is understanding what's happening inside a human being, particularly since we all overvalue that experience. When a judger is trying to figure out how a perceiver wants order inside, it's usually something they can't wrap their head around. When a perceiver is trying to figure out how judgers want inner world freedom, that's not something that really tracks. And so we're going to talk a little bit about those qualities and characteristics, and then we'll give some examples of what this might look like in the outside world. You may be a perceiver right now saying, I don't want organization in my inner space. I, I enjoy the freedom I have to explore my heart or my mind. And I would argue that what you're actually talking about there is sovereignty, the ability to explore or do the things you want to do. And you still have a sense of organization. You may just not couch it that way because it's not external organization. You probably have an internal organizational metric or method that you're organizing information and emotions so you can access them when you want to. It's very personal to you. It's a personal cataloging. Again, I'm using extroverted language or traditional judger language for the inner space. So whatever this would mean to you, you're still evaluating and sorting and organizing things and, and keeping them in tight control. And so when you say that, well, I still want to have freedom, even in my inner space, I think what you're saying is I don't want to be tied down from an external framework around how I can access all that inner stuff. But you still have some personal way that you organize the way that you process emotion or thought for yourself. Yeah, I, we have a compulsion as perceivers to see ourselves as free birds and always wanting freedom, even if we have a, an understanding of a desire for an orderly life, we still have a sense of we don't want anything to tie us down. And so this idea of inner world organization can be a little complicated. Like you said, it's usually about sovereignty. Now, what's interesting is that desire for sovereignty is connected to inner world organization. So uh, we, I think it's easiest to understand organization in terms of what we do in the outside world, right? That's the easiest. That's what we can all see and look at. So we're going to borrow some terms, borrow some concepts from how we do it in the outside world to understand what's going on internally. So a big part of how we organize our outer world right, when we're organizing the outside world is we do that through uh, through prior priorities, right? What are we going to spend our time on? What thing comes first? What ends up on the list of to-do items? How are we going to place things in order to find them quickly, right? Like a place for everything and everything in its place. Oh, who moved the scissors, right? They're supposed to be in the scissor drawer or whatever. So that's how we do it in the outside world. Now, there is a version of that that happens internally for us as perceivers. And that is we are always scanning our inner world for what takes priority, what is important to us, what makes the most logical sense. And when we understand what our priorities are, the values that resonate with us, our core principles, the things that are truly important to us, we have a relatively complex system of placing these things. It's not oversimplified. Imagine somebody who is incredibly good at organization in the outside world, and they have all these really complex systems that are running. Imagine somebody who's maybe a structural engineer who has to organize tons of resources, lots of different people, lots of different moving you know, uh, uh, resource around, uh, a lot of timelines they have to take into consideration. And so they have to create a very complex system in the outside world. It might even look like chaos to somebody else, but they have it all it, they have it all ordered, right? They, they know when they're supposed to hit deploy on certain things. They know when somebody is supposed to be delivering something. They know when somebody else is, you know, supposed to take the mantle and run with it. This person's job is over now. This person's job is just starting. They have all of this concept like a contractor would. And so it's a complex system that might look like chaos to everybody else, but it's actually highly structured. Now take that concept and bring it internally, there are usually very complex systems running inside of perceivers, complex systems of what is in alignment for them, what is important to them, what is high priority, 
what kind of convictions that they're going to associate with, what are their personal core principles. And it, to some extent, might look chaotic to the outside world if they were ever to, you know, be able to crack, you know, pop up in the hood and look at it. But that's because there's a lot of things being taken into consideration. A lot of things that might even look like they're contradicting each other. A lot of things that are high priority that uh, the person that is, you know, sort of juggling all this might have to find elegant tension points between. It's a matter of determining how things are making you feel and, de- and, and what that means about you as a complex identity and putting it in some sort of sense of alignment before you make actions or excuse me, after you make an action and then determine how that experience really like sort of gelled with you or resonated with you. And there may be a complex like counsel inside of you, lots of different voices, lots of different perspectives, lots of different, you know, uh, pieces of insight and wisdom that are all talking to each other all the time to determine what is right for me. That's one style of a perceiver. The other style of a perceiver is taking in masses amounts of information and data, trying to understand, understand things in terms of their complexities and running high, like high compl- highly complex systems inside the mind to be able to plug all these pieces of data inside. These systems might be shifting landscapes of concepts. They might be models. They might be things that are highly abstract or they might be things that are less abstract, but more of a sense of like, I know where that I know where that piece of data is because I remember what peg I hung it on. It's like a card catalog inside the mind. It's an ability to grab relevant information when it needs to be expressed or when it needs to be used in an action or activity. And because the inner world is organized for perceivers, they're able to access these pieces of information, whether it's data heavy or whether or not it's identity heavy, regardless of whether or not it's values or core principles, they're able to grab those pieces of information quickly when they need it. Now, the, all of that prioritization and organization and all that, I will, I'm the kind of person who will do this and I'm the kind of person who would never do this. I'm the kind of person who thinks this is important and this is my core principle or I'm the kind of person who thinks this is valuable and this is a conviction. The reason why there is so much organization and structure inside is because of the desire for outer world freedom. If you are put in situations over and over again because you've put yourself in them to be improvisational and spontaneous and to do things at the last minute and to do things at the 11th hour and to just be able to sort of, you know, move through space in this effortless flow sort of way. You need to have those pieces of information very easily accessible. You need to know how you feel about something. You need to be able to organize how you feel about things quickly through the experience of having done so many times in the past because you're going to find yourself in situations that require quick thinking. You're going to find yourself in a situation that's going to call upon you to know what you think or feel about something in that moment, right? You don't get a lot of planning because you're not a person who sets things up for planning. You're a person who sets things up to respond quickly in the moment. So whether or not you need a piece of data to access quickly because you're doing maybe a sport or you're in some sort of, you know, high um, octane, you know, optimized performance situation, or whether or not you're the kind of person who is performing or expressing or in a situation where you're just kind of handing yourself over to the environment, you need to know, am I the kind of person who will go down that road or go down this road? I need to know that right now because the environment is asking me to choose quickly. And that's why perceivers want that organization internally is because it supports the outer world freedom. Now, that doesn't mean you always know. Sometimes you end up in a situation where you haven't spelunked that part of who you are inside. But then the experience itself allows you an opportunity to then process your experience that you had in the outside world and now know all that data about yourself. It's like it's it's an even further way to organize inner world understanding by having these outer world experiences. These situations you could have never predicted tell you more about who you are inside. So then the inner world organization fuels the outer world experience by giving you data you need in the last minute. But then the outer world experiences facilitate the inner world organization by giving you tons of context that now you have to know yourself more or you get to know yourself more through these experiences. You get to post-process them later and go, who am I now that I've had that experience? What do I believe or what do I think now that I've learned this new information? And then now that inner world organization just gets tighter. This gets to the point where perceivers will even track external things internally. 
they'll use their internal organization to track external things in their life. As an example, from my own personal life, I am a perceiver. If you ask me for a certain piece of paperwork, I've got an entire stack of papers on my desk. It looks chaotic. It looks terribly messy. But if Antonia asked me, hey, where is that one tax form that we're supposed to file next week? I would say, aha, I know exactly where it is. It's in pile number two, the left pile. And I would go down to the middle of the pile and I'd be able to pull that piece of paper out. I don't have a formal filing system for those papers that are on my desk yet. Now I'll get to it eventually. It takes me a long time to get them all filed. But I have an internal metric. I have a little tether in my brain that I've got an organizational structure. I remember where I put that and I'm tracking it internally. Now, this can cause stress. This can break down because I'm not writing it down where it is. And sometimes I lose that piece of paper and I'm like, where? It's got to be here. I remember, I'll say stuff like, I remember putting it here. It's got to be here. If somebody moves it or the location shifts or I'm really going fast, I might not track it internally and lose track of things in my outside world. But the desire is to always track things internally if we can as perceivers. Now, again, that breaks down over time. So we have to still rely on external systems when the complexity gets too much. But our desire is to track things internally, even if they're external things. Yeah, I'm reluctant to file things because I'm pretty sure I'll never see that piece of paper again. Like the second something goes into some sort of organized formal filing system in the outside world, that's when I lose it. Yes. Yeah, I'm like, I don't file things until I never have to see them. <laughs> and you're right, as the, as things get more complex, it becomes harder and harder to track those things internally. And you have to turn to an outer world organizational structure. And it is like so hard to bridge that gap for me as a perceiver. It's like, ugh, but then if I put it in a folder... I'll, I'll never find that piece of paper again, even if it's clearly marked in like, you know, neon letters. The piece of paper you're looking for is in this folder. I'm still going to lose it. The other thing I would say about perceivers is that sh that organization can often be preloaded for when we need it later, right? We can organize things knowing if we have an internal organizational system, we can be very improv improvisational when the time arises. You and I, Antonia, probably eight years ago, went to lunch with a friend of yours who had INFP preferences. And she was a improvisational actor. Like that's the career that she actually performed. Like that was her job, basically. And she was making these lists at the time. It was the height, I think, of the Downton Abbey show. And she was making lists like the character traits of Downton Abbey characters, funny situations, like all these lists, 10 to 20 bullet pointed lists of all these different things of Downton Abbey. And she was memorizing all these little character traits and situations that the characters found themselves in. I said, what are you, why are you making this list? And she said, well, when I'm on stage doing improv, I want to have a bunch of stuff in my brain preloaded, thought about ahead of time so that I could pull off any of these lists in the moment, because we get a lot of comments right now about Downton Abbey because it's really popular. It's a popular show. And so in improv, people will shout out something, you know, say something about Downton Abbey or, you know, give us a situation with Downton Abbey. And so she now has that preloaded, whether she uses it or not, she's already pre-wired her brain to have some of that information for when she's on stage. So this is something else I think perceivers can do. And w depending on your profession, you might preload things for when you need them later. Mm, absolutely. What a great example. I find myself doing that all the time. I just plug personality type content into my brain. And then if I need it on stage or if I need it in a moment when I'm speaking in front of an audience of people, I've got it. It's in there. It's in there somewhere. And I, and I don't even know how the mechanism works consciously. I just know that I unconsciously can grab that information I've plugged into it. And so that is, a, I think that those are very perceiver-like traits. And when a perceiver rests into this, Right? You'll see perceivers who are afraid to hand themselves over to this process and they get weirdly uptight and they struggle to know whether they're a perceiver or a judger because they're afraid to lean into this part of who they are in part because the world does not train us to do that. In fact, I would argue that the world is very much in favor of the judger style, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And so we don't get a lot of recommendations to, to rest into and trust our capacity to uh, to be able to pull on these things in the last minute. But a lot of perceivers instead will say things like, I'm really good at pulling rabbits out of hats, or I'm really good at 11th hours, right? Like that last minute when the paper is due the next day, and I haven't been working on it for the last three weeks, but somehow I get this like 40 page, 50 page paper done 
the night before and I stayed up all night and just drank a lot of ca- you know coffee. That is a very common perceiver um, way of going about things. And so it's not to say that judges never can do that, but this tends to be more of a perceiver trait. And when they hand themselves over to the ability to pull a rabbit out of a hat, to trust their inner world organization, to do the due diligence of organizing that internal space, when they are vigilant and diligent about that, and then they are more improvisational and spontaneous in the outside world, they feel like their best selves. They feel like this is what they were made to do. We will be right back. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning, we are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker. Now back to the show. So let's switch gears. Let's talk about you judgers that are listening right now. If you're a judger listening, you know that you appreciate having things in the outer world organized. And because of that, you can deal with a lot of complexity. You have a scalability with complexity because you typically have organizational systems that allow you to manage large groups of people, projects, things that are going on in your life, information. I see judges often beautifully working through the world and managing lots of stuff. I'm very envious of how you do it often as a judger. And this does open up the freedom, though, in your inner space to wander the halls of your mind or heart. And uh, we can talk a little about what that exact freedom looks like, because that's a, again, that's an interesting and unique concept. Like, what do you mean wander the freedom of my inner space? What does that even mean? I think that most judges, it's not, it doesn't take long to understand this concept of the internal improvisation, spontaneity, or freedom. Now, you might not think about this phrase of improvisation or spontaneity being applied to the inner world. So let's use the word freedom most often because that's the easiest way to understand it. When a judger goes inside, their natural proclivity is to not order their inner world, but be led by it in the sense of exploring what's happening inside of themselves. Now, there's two primary ways that a judger will do this. One is by ruminating over an experience that they've already had and allowing themselves to almost passively watch it again like it was a movie or, you know, observe the past that they went through for hidden gems, things that they might have missed the first time, and understand or sort of have it emerge that they're changed now. They're maybe a different person now because of this experience they had, or maybe they see things in a slightly different way. But it wasn't really a matter of determining specifically that they were going to be looking for, I'm going to look for this and this and this data. I'm going to determine who I am as a human being and what my convictions are based on this. It's more like, I'm just going to kind of let it happen in front of me. I'm going to go with the flow and be an effortless flow with my memory about what happened to me in the past or the information that I've consumed that other people have experienced in the past. The other style of ruminating or sort of, want, I call it wandering the garden of your mind, is by letting your imagination take you someplace. And maybe even be working on an idea or a concept, and an insight. I think of this as almost like a, a bloodhound on a trail where you're not sure where this is going to end up. You're just allowing your mind to guide you, to lead you, almost like a bloodhound that's on a scent of something. And when you get to the final insight or aha, well, then you get to know what that is at the same time as your mind emerges it. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't a formula you're working on. It wasn't like math or it wasn't like, okay, who am I and what are my values? And I'm going to pit them against each other and sort of have this big conversation inside my mind and maybe argue it from multiple points. It, it's, not that, uh, it's not that assertive. It's not really that uh, outcome oriented. You're not really trying to solve a problem. You're not trying to figure something out. You're allowing your mind to take you to different places that you might not have even imagined you'd go. And so when you're 
quote unquote, wandering the garden of your mind or allowing that inner world freedom. And I would say the way spontaneity or improvisation comes in here is that when you are when you're inside your mind, you might be quite surprised at where it takes you. It might feel almost spontaneous, like it came out of nowhere. It might feel like you're improvising ideas or concepts or sort of looking at these experiences you've had in a new way. It's, it's, a, it's very much handing yourself over to the environment of your inner terrain. Just like a perceiver hands themselves over to the environment of the outer terrain. I just want to see what's going to happen next. I just want to, I just want to watch what's, where the world is going to take me. So that's happening in the outside world for perceivers, and that's what's happening in the inner world for judgers. I just want to see where my brain is going to take me. I just want to understand what these little hidden jewels and insights are. I just want to ruminate over these experiences or in my imagination. And and because of that, things that I would have never predicted end up being given to me as gifts of these ruminations. The phrase train of thought, I think is a good phrase here. Because perceivers, in order to organize their inner world, we need to atomize information and feelings, and we place those in an organizational structure inside of ourselves. But there's almost a train of thought for judges in the inner space. You're wandering this train of thought, almost like a trail or train tracks you're going on. And it's not so much random access that you're jumping around in freedom. It's that there's a new trail, maybe a fork in the road that's presented. And you're like, oh, I want to wander down that side path. And then another one forms and you wander, wander, you want to wander down that side path. It's more of a wandering, following the trails that emerge for you. And the freedom is you can choose whichever trail you want to go down. You don't necessarily have to stay on the specific train of thought. Now, this can be a little bit of a challenge for judges because it's so linear in its feeling for you. It feels linear. And these trains and trails of thought go down that if you're interrupted from that wandering, sometimes it's impossible ever to make your way back to that train of thought. Like you're pulled out of the moment. And because it's not random accessed, atomized information or feelings, you almost have to go all the way back down that trail to find where you were. And sometimes that's impossible for you. I, I can't tell you how many INJs in particular, INFJs and INTJs, if I interrupt them in a flow of thought or imagination, sometimes they never get back to where they were at the point that I interrupt, interrupted them. And that could be massively frustrating. Well, there's no sense of needing to order it and so there are no waypoints right like in when if there was a sense of organization with that rumination then there would be like points where it's almost like save points in a game like oh this is important i'm going to save it here or this is important i'm going to save it here well you might not it might not be important it's your brain is just going wherever it goes so why would you have save points right why would you put cairns or waypoints to go oh i can find my way back it's like I'm I'm just going with the flow, right? Like in the outside world, if you were exploring, you know, something in the outside world, you wouldn't necessarily the first time you're exploring it put down waypoints. You wouldn't go, this is an important one. You you don't know, you're still exploring it. And so that's a big piece of that inner world exploration or sort of freedom is that when you are on a trail, it, it you don't know if it's an important one until the conclusion, until you get to that point of insight. And so as you mentioned, Joel, if there's disruptions, if it was an interesting one, you don't know if it was an important one, but it was an interesting one and it was going somewhere. But now I'm distracted. Now I'm disrupted. Now I can't I, I can't get back there because I didn't have a save point. I didn't know to say have a save point. I was just letting it happen. I was letting it unfold in front of me. And so now I guess I guess I don't get to have that one again. So often those save points for a judger look like writing it down in a journal, making a note, you're externalizing the, the judgment or the tracking of that, the information of that, right? And so this is why a lot of judges appreciate journaling, freeform journaling to mine their minds and be able to pull the thoughts out and capture those thoughts as they're happening because it might be hard to get back to them. So writing it down, pulling it outside of yourself and putting it on paper can be a fantastic tool for you to capture the where, where your mind is wandering to. It also helps explain why judges are more focused on outer world organization because the outer world, is it has a tendency to trend towards chaos. But if you have an organized outer world, then now you can carve out space for yourself to do these internal freedom wanderings. 
Like, I'm going to set aside this amount of time to go do that. Or I'm going to say, hey, when, you know, when the sign is up, please don't disrupt me. Or I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to make a, a, a situation where like the kids all know where these items are so they don't have to come bug me about it every time because I've, I've clearly laid it out. It is highly organized. There are your crayons. Go do, you know, go, go grab them as opposed to mom, where are the crayons? Or dad, where are the crayons? <laughs> every time, right? You've organized it. You've made it so that it is dummy proof to the outside world. And because of that, you're able to now, when you go inside, have far fewer distractions. It's also why judges have a tendency to prefer things like having their back to a wall and facing a door so they can see disruptions coming. If you can see a disruption coming, it's not as jarring. You might be able to, as Joel just mentioned, write down where you were at in your thought really quickly. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the the thought was too emergent and complex, but sometimes that helps out. And so you can see that distraction coming and know that, well, I'm not going to be as frustrated when I'm inside. And that's one of the reasons why, too, a lot of IJ types have a tendency to identify as highly sensitive those distractions can be jarring to them. It can be a jarring experience to be thrown out of that freedom experience. And so uh, so there's a lot of highly sensitive IJ types out there in particular because they lead with this desire, this need to go internal and, and do this freedom. And so really that outer world organization in part is there to facilitate the inner world freedom experience. And then the inner world freedom experience is where you get your creativity. It's where you get your ideas. It's where you kind of understand things as they emerge for you. In the same way that perceivers are using the outer world, you know, spontaneous experiences to help go inside and, you know, understand themselves more and create more organization inside of themselves. And then that organization inside of themselves helps facilitate the outer world freedom, right? Just like that's a beautiful back and forth. Judges have one of these too. When they go inside and they have creativity expressed in there and they allow insight to emerge and things that they missed the last time and to fill in the holes, now they have so much more rich content to bring to the outside world to know what systems they want to set up, what things are important to them, what are the kinds of, you know, what kind of organization and structure do they want in the outside world? Well, they know that about themselves by getting that internal creativity going. And once you have that vision or that idea or that concept or that thing that emerged, well, now you can get into work, you know, building it in the outside world and seeing it not just in your imagination or in your mind, but you can actually see it manifest in the outside world. To see those things manifest in the outside world, though, requires order and structure to build those things. And so you can see how there's just as beautiful a back and forth of this outer world organization, inner world freedom expressed in a way that fuels itself. It goes back and forth and really kind of feeds into the machine in the same way, but in a uh, photo negative style than the perceivers. So you can see why these dichotomy lists get made, right? Because we have a tendency to understand ourselves through sets of behaviors. Any list you see that is going to be a judger list versus a perceiver list are all going to represent these outer world manifestations. And so the judger list is going to talk a lot about like outer world organization and and all of the things that we just mentioned, which is a desire for judgers in order to have that inner world freedom. And for perceivers, it's going to be a list of outer world desire for improvisation, spontaneity, etc. The challenge is that we actually have all these desires in us. We have a desire for both inner world and outer world freedom, and we have a desire for inner world and outer world organization, right? We all, we all need all of these on some level. So what type does is it tells us what our preferences are if we're, we're forced to choose one of these things, if we're forced to choose just two of them, which one are we going to naturally default to? Which ones are more our natural style? And which ones are uh, so much our natural style that when life gets complex or when we're pulled on to really reach for something more, maybe become the best versions of ourselves, which of these styles do we need to lean into? So you'll see perceivers raised in a very judger context. And oftentimes these are perceivers that don't identify with all of the lists about perceivers. They're a little more orderly. They're a little bit more organized in the outside world. That's how they were trained. It's important to them. They're, uh, they identify with this idea of, you know, sort of having things in their place. And really, I mean, I know some perceivers that practically vacuum their way out of their houses. They have to have everything pristine. 
And I know some judges that very much identify with this idea of going with the flow, right? They just kind of want to be in the flow of life and they don't really want to have to organize and they hate, you know, I hate cleaning, I hate organizing my house, etc. The challenge here though is, or excuse me, I wouldn't say the challenge, I would say a litmus test actually. A litmus test is as your life becomes more and more complex, what do you have to do in order to keep up with the complexity? And for judges, generally the more complex their life gets, the more a strong system in the outside world is what they have to lean on. And they do it well, right? They have these complex systems in the outside world. They structure things. Okay, so it was just me, but now it's me and a partner. Okay, it was just me and a partner, but now it's me and a bunch of kids and a partner. Okay, now it was just me and a partner and kids, but now we've got a dog. Okay, now we have a property. Now we have a house. Now we have like two jobs going. Like <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like it gets complex. And a judger will need to have more and more outer world organization to be able to keep up with it. And they'll be able to facilitate a life like that through more organization and structure. Now, it doesn't mean that they'll necessarily be running boot camps by by the end of all of this, and it doesn't have to turn military, but they do have to have a level of system in the outside world that is commensurate to the to fighting the chaos. Because if the chaos gets too much, the judger then will not be able to have that inner world rumination space that they so desperately need in order to feel like a complete person. They have to have that. So if it's between outer world chaos and inner world chaos, they will choose inner world quote unquote chaos and outer world structure to be able to get all of their natural native needs met. Even if they can have a little bit of all of it, they can juggle a little of all of it, their natural preference will go that direction. Versus a perceiver. The more complex a perceiver's life is, the more difficult it is to have all of these systems running. A single a perceiver who is single and it's just themselves, oh my goodness, they can have like the most organized house you've ever seen. <laughs> and they can have, you know, a very organized schedule and very organized relationships and everything can be very orderly. But now you add a partner. Now you add children. Now you add household pets. Now you had property. Now you had all those complexities to it and the perceiver just cannot keep up. And in fact, the more structured the outside world requires them to be, the more resentment they'll feel. They'll start to resent their lives. They'll start to feel like it's just robbing them of all their sovereignty and, and any sense of inner authority. They'll feel like everything is just being poured into trying to manage these systems and they won't feel like themselves. They'll start to resent, not just resent it, but start to avoid it. They'll try to get away from it and then they won't be very connected to their lives at all. They need to instead go more with the flow. They have to let go of societal expectations to have the perfect yard in the front or to have all the toys or whatever it is. They have to be in a space of, of making sure they're getting enough experiences in the outside world that nourish their desire for improvisation and freedom, which means we don't spend our money on things, we spend them on experiences. That's a very perceiver way of looking at things. Um, now, some judges can feel that way too, so don't think this is just a judger thing, but the more complex your life gets, the more you have to weave these elements in, these spontaneous experiential elements to fuel your personal creativity. So it means like, oh, okay, so I guess my bathrooms are a little dirty this week, but we were able to go with the kids, you know, out hiking in nature, and it was just, it was the best trade-off. And if a perceiver doesn't allow themselves to have that sense of freedom as their life gets more complex, again, they will feel very detached from who they are because those outer world experiences are what help them know who they are internally. It's their ballast for understanding what kind of identity they have, what's important to them, what are their core values and principles. These are critical. So it's not a matter of what we're doing and it's not even really a matter of the kind of environment we prefer. It's a matter of how we respond to increasing complexity. And as we have increasing complexity, what are the kinds of things that make us feel more like ourselves? And what are the things that make us feel throttled or strangled in these situations? And so everybody's got to figure that out for themselves. <laughs> You've got to kind of watch yourself, observe your behavior, observe how you respond to the environment, observe what your natural state is, what you prefer the most. And if you have a very simple life, that might be harder to know. If you have a complex life, sometimes that's easier to determine. But regardless, again, I just want to put a little bit of note out here. The reason why we say we need all, all, all of these you know, all of these desires is because if you look at our cognitive functions 
and we each have four of them, four mental processes that influence us the most, each of those four represent a different one of these needs. All right, you're going to have a first or dominant, what we call a driver function, that is one of these needs. You're going to have a second one that is one of these needs and on down. So there is a little bit of all of these desires living inside of us, but they don't take equal precedent. They are not equally weighed. Some of them are desires that we have to meet sometimes, and others are the desires we have to design a life around. And that's really important to determine. So hopefully this gave you some insight into the judger versus perceiver split so that you can determine what is something I can do versus what is something I must do? What is something that I feel good about versus something I feel compelled to do? And how do I respond to increasing complexity in my life? And uh, bringing some understanding to the other as well. I think there's this there's this envy that perceivers can sometimes have with judges getting to set the tone in our world because we do live in a judger organized world, right? Everything is externally organized and how we process paperwork, where we drive on the road, you know, you drive on the right side of the road in America and the UK, you go on the left side, like that all had to be decided upon and set up as a system outside of ourselves. And there's this envy, like, why do I have to play with all the systems that are set up outside of myself as a perceiver? You might be asking yourself if you're a perceiver. And just know there's a part of you that does appreciate the external organization. We really benefit from it. I think that's something that we can appreciate and understand we benefit from. I think on the other side, there's some frustration from the judges. They've set up this world and they're like, look, if everybody just does a little bit, everybody just adds in a little bit, there's not so much heavy lifting on some of us, right? If we can all just buy in, this is how things operate out here life can go so much better, right, everybody? And us perceivers are a little rebellious, and sometimes we don't like to follow the structures and systems and rules set up. And I think that can be frustrating for judges on the other side of the equation. And again, I think judges can understand the need and desire, even in themselves, for spontaneity and the ability to pivot and, you know, a little bit more free form in the outer world. So I think judges can appreciate the perceiver freedom that they have. And they also appreciate, I think, the inner organization as well. If you're a judge, you're listening right now, and you have a perceiver friend or partner or family member, they might be able to really help you get into your inner thoughts and understand what you're thinking or your inner emotions, understand what you are feeling, what you're thinking and feeling, not what the external world tells you to think and feel, right? And if you're a perceiver, I think you can appreciate the judges in your life, helping provide structure and support and all the things set up in, in the outer world that you can benefit from. So I think there's a lot of benefit from the other. And I think there's a lot of understanding that could be created and a lot of appreciation that can be created as well because there's so many beautiful things that each of us brings to this world. Yeah, I really admire judges' ability to be creative by themselves. Mm. Because for a judger, it's when you go inside of yourself that you have the most creativity generally. And uh, I always have to have outer world stimuli to be creative. And so I very much envied that ability. And I know that there are judges who have expressed to me my ability to be creative in the outside world, to be an improvisational speaker and to not have to go up with many notes and just be able to talk. And so we oftentimes really do admire each other. Um, and uh, and I think, that's, I think that that's really the beauty of type. The beauty of type is to turn some of that envy that can also turn into frustration and sometimes resentment into understanding and appreciation. And and then I think also an appreciation for the self, you know, like to be able to go, oh, these are my gifts. Even if they might have been demonized in my life or people didn't really understand them, I can understand them. I can appreciate myself and, and rest into the ways that are healthiest for me to show up. If I'm showing up with these strong preferences, I'm going to be the best version of myself and it's going to be easy for people to give me more space to be that person. All right. You haven't had a microphone. It's just been me and Antonia here talking with each other. You've been listening along. But now it's time to hear from you. I want you to come over to personalityhacker.com directly below this episode. Leave a comment, ask a question, or more importantly, share your story. Are you a judger who really appreciates that inner world freedom and you have really great structures in the outside world? Or maybe you have a hard time building structure even as a judger. Maybe you've got some challenges there you want to express and share with us. Or you figured it all out and you got that to express as well. Come over and make your voice heard. Or you're a perceiver and you do some of those internal organizational things so that you have external improvisation in your life. 
What is your story? What goes on for you? Your voice is important to us. Come over to personalityhacker.com below this episode. Make your voice heard. And if you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. If you leave us a rating and review on iTunes, it helps us out a lot. And I read every one, so please go do it. We have a book. It's called Personality Hacker. You can get it at all major book retailers. And if you are interested in diving deeper into that thing we kept hinting about in this four-part series, Cognitive Functions, well, you can start with the Personality Hacker book. We talk about the Cognitive Functions stack or the what we call the car model for each of the 16 personality types. And we give you some insight onto how to how to have the best relationship with these functions. So get that at all major book retailers. And if you like it, leave us a rating or review on Amazon or on Goodreads. If you want to take your personal growth to the next level using personality systems like the ones we were talking about, head over to personalityhacker.com and there is a suite of programs that are just waiting for you to peruse. See if there's one that's right for you in this moment. You might want to take your understanding of yourself to the next level. And if that's the case, we highly recommend looking at the programs that are designed for your unique personality type. These programs are not theory. They're based on years of coaching and helping our clients get results in their life. So these programs are designed with the lens of personality type to help you how you're uniquely wired on your growth path. Again, it's not just theory or information. There's advice, there's tools, there's trainings, there's systems, there's ways to actually use this information in a very personal way in your life. And I think it's incredible for your personal growth journey. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning, we are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker.